This is going to be our uh, cohort three uh, M Shiny Mastering Shiny book club. Um, this is going to be chapter four, chapter fourteen, which is the reactive graph. Um, what we're going to do is complement a previous topic, and I believe Lucy conducted that, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but chapter three was uh, a basic reactivity, so it kind of talks about how you can make a reactive function, and then uh, what that context does in the um, world of web development and, and Shiny as a, as a web service. This reactive graph is going to kind of deep dive into that, and it will set up for the next four chapters. I think it's 14 through 17, I believe, is all topics related to reactivity. Um, the, the, the later part of M. Shiny's book really puts a lot of context on reactivity as a whole. And so this chapter kind of sets up that foundation. Olu presented last uh, last week um, and and kind of set up the stages for uh, beginning this uh, this conversation. So thank you Olu, for the for doing that. Um, let me share screens. Uh, let's move this over here real quick. Sorry, team. Put that there and share. No, nope, that's my chat window. Forgive me. There we go. Share desktop two and hit share. Okay, so I don't have anything up yet. So let's go over to our Chrome browser. There we go. And I'm going to move the tile over there. Okay. So what we have is I, I don't have a formal presentation for this chapter. And Brendan, that's uh, our exchange. That's partly why um, I caught this at the last minute, but it's okay. I I'm good for this. Uh, so what I'll end up doing is using the uh, M Shiny book chapter 14 as just a, a guideline of topics that we will discuss. Now, I wanna just quickly rehash exactly what reactivity implies. Um, up to this chapter, we have talked about cache memory. Cache is C-A-C-H-E, uh, spelled as cache like mo money. Uh, but cache memory is an allocation of web space temporary files storage, where when we initiate the server and when we initiate the UI, the browser itself, the, the link between the two, a amount of memory is provided for that uh, app or that, that browser, that server UI exchange to occur. Now that cache memory is vital to the understanding of what reactivity implies. The second comment I was going to make is throughout all of the presentations I've given on this book club so far, I always try to make a very clear, distinct delineation between the UI, your browser, and the server, the actual kernel, kernel uh, that is R, that is making all your calculations. And now in the, in the context of you starting Shiny local to your machine, right? You've got RStudio open, you say, you know, run app, and then bang, all of a sudden you've got this web browser open and you're interacting with it, et cetera. That's all local to your machine. And it still uses those cache services and everything else is, is, uh, is just like it would be in real world. However, when we bring in other web services like Shiny.io uh, or the uh, RStudio, What's the professional naming convention that they have uh, for the uh, the uh, online web version of our studio? Um, there's a there's a paid service, and I can't remember the name of that. There's a there's a definition that'll trigger. At any rate, we can execute those same commands, but now you have to remember that you're you're adding some geographic distance between your locale where you're you're interacting with this service at, and wherever the server is anywhere in the world. So what I'm what I'm wanting to do is is separate these two logic points between the UI and the server because you have to also inc uh, incorporate HTTP uh, hypertext protocol and then just being able to use JavaScript to exchange back and forth over this particular protocol this this language um, the uh, layer seven application layer uh, of networking. Now that's that's all advanced topics, but. I, I, I want you to separate those two thought processes. Now, coming back to reactivity, what we're going to do is when the server starts, it will generate a particular stack, right? This memory allocation. And we have, uh, 
UI elements and server elements. And then those two are linking together. That's where you get the render graph or render some, some output, okay? So what we're gonna do is a step-by-step -step tour of this particular graph. And it's, it's much, much easier once I actually turn on the graph to see it in, in action to make sense of exactly what this particular script does. So what we have is the first graphic. Um, I'll zoom in just briefly here. See if I can, nope, see if I can make that slightly larger. What you'll see are these particular um, figure, this, this images, okay? So on the, on the right-hand side of this, sorry, left-hand side of the image, the figure, that's gonna be your, your objects, these named objects. So we allocate memory to those, or we, we assign values to those named objects. So that's what we're gonna have on the, on the, uh, the left. The rendering component, all right, is gonna be on the right, uh, right hand side. So think of that as like the server's end. And in the middle here is kind of this arrow sort of object. Now, if anybody has ever worked with flowcharts or, or the, the, uh, the uh, squares and diamonds and trapezoids, et cetera, of a flowchart, think of this in, in a similar context. So each one of these symbols represents some component of logic that occurs, okay? Continuing further, so, I'm going to use this primary script, uh, this, this uh, uh, example, um, as our focal point of the conversation. And we'll be able to interact with it. I'm going to change some values and we're going to see the graph uh, grow. Um, it, it records itself, it, it, it actually uh, stores that uh, cached memory changes and then paints that to a screen so you can actually walk through. Uh, the uh, the relationship between your UI and your and your server. Okay, so briefly, let's just look at what we're doing here. So we have the UI fluid page, fluid meaning that it's an HTML5 element, and that we're going to uh, it's going to be dynamic. It'll change. We can we can change our screen, and everything will just kind of flow and 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 reorient itself uh, as needed. Um, I've talked about this in the past with uh, differences of using a laptop screen versus a tablet versus a you know mobile device, your phone, um, your your screen resolution changes. And so depending on how you're interacting with this, this fluid page allows us to manipulate that. So we have three uh, numeric inputs. Uh, we're labeling them as A, B, and C. Now, the important point here, if you remember what these numeric inputs are, the first um, argument that we pass into those assigned values is the identifier. So our identifier that we're telling it is going to be uh, a, a character A, B, and C. Now, what value is printed to the screen is going to be the second value, and that's also A, B, and C. That's going to be our, our uh, selections that we have. Now, the values, right, the values that we are, are initially assigning those is 10, 1, and 1. And once I have this up and running, this will start to kind of make sense. The next is going to have a plot. So we're going to create a graphical object. It's going to be a histogram. But the, the plot output isn't necessarily ggplot, but it could be. Um, the, the, the plot argument that we're creating here is, is kind of more base R oriented. We also have a table that we'll create at the bottom of our, our uh, UI. And then we have a text output. Okay. And we're going to see that those are labeled x, y, and z. From the server's perspective, and maybe I should stay here for a second. From the server's perspective, we're going to have this function input output session that's required for any Shiny application. Right? This is going to establish that memory allocation. It's going to establish the, the reactivity or the option of reactivity. Um, it's the inputs, the outputs, and then the active session to interact with inputs and outputs. Um, so we've got a, a range, argue, uh, range named variable. Uh, we're going to be assigning it a reactive call uh, with input A. Now, this first point is going to be related to this numeric input A. Right? So this is the UI. When I select that, it's going to send that back to the server, and this is how it's managing it. We're going to multiply it by two. Um, SMP, I'm not familiar with that nomenclature, and I apologize. Uh, same with BC. Um, maybe it's sample. Maybe it's shorthand for sample. But that's going to be another reactive call. We have a sample range, and this is going to be interacting with element B or, or object B. So we have input dollar sign B. And this is going to be replaced true 
we'll see what that implies here in a moment. That's going to actually uh, reset our cache memory. When we change the value, this, is, this will be the trigger that resets. And then the uh, BC, BC, BC. I'm, I, again, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what the acronyms are implying here. Uh, but BC, reactive call, input B, and then multiplied by input uh, C. Now the outputs, this is where we're sending that data and that correlates up here to our plot output, table output, and text output. So output X, output Y, and output Z. We're gonna render plot, render table, render text. Um, earlier, and I don't remember what chapter it was, maybe chapter four, where we were linking the differences between a named variable input value on the UI versus the render argument uh, below. Okay, so let's see what happens here. Now, as the session begins, everything is instantiated. It's it's started, but we, we, we have no reactivity yet. It's just assigning the values and they're out there, but we have no uh, relation to the uh, interaction of the browser just yet. This happens so, so, so quickly that you don't even really realize what's going on. Um, when you start this app, the reactive graph automatically goes to uh, iteration 37. So there's... 37 activities that occur just by starting the app. So once you instantiate and then everything starts to um, update itself, there's 37 times that, that occur in that, that point. Okay. I'll show you in a moment what that 37 implies. Um, there's three important points in this figure. The first one is no connections between the elements because Shiny has no priory or no memory of this existing initially. So I have no idea what this app is doing. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like starting it from infancy. Uh, it, it has no memory. It has no allocation. It's just being able to call on these, these variables. All reactive expressions and outputs are in their starting state or invalidated gray. That's key. When we are discussing this graph in a moment, the color codes are green, uh, yellow, and gray. Uh, the reactive inputs are ready, green, indicating that their values are available for computation if required. And I'm, I'm adding a little bit of text there. The comment of if required means that I haven't actually done anything with them yet. We've instantiated them, but we haven't, react, or we haven't interacted with them yet. Okay, so now execution begins. Um, I'm going to briefly go through this really fast because it's going to be easier to, to witness the reactive graph itself. So as we begin these interaction points, it's a reset of cached memory. So if the variables that we express change, then it's going to reset the value and then recalculate it and then enter that back into cache memory again. What is not stated, what is not exactly clearly stated in this chapter is the relationship of what an R6 class implies. Now, most of what Shiny in interprets is all R6 related. Um, this is a very, very low level, and Frederica is probably the, the one person in the team that would, would know my references to what that implies. In advanced R, if you want to know more about the S3, S4, R6 classes, um, John just posted a moment ago about the R7 class that will be coming out shortly, which is a new iteration of the S3, S4 um, memory format. Okay. Continuing on, once we reset, then there's a, a cascading effect of how all of these calculations work. And so graphically, what we're, we're witnessing here is the actual CPU processing the media, or maybe CPU is not the right term I should use. It's the relationship between your server, your UI, and this cache memory halfway in between. So as the UI requests something, the cache memory changes, the server is related to that, notices the change, it resets itself, and then it recalculates and populates again. Okay. Uh, let's see, two graph ways. Um, it's talking about the arrows, the, the different uh, formats of, of what's happening. Um, reading the input, reactive expressions complete. So as this uh, cached element, this memory allocation updates, um, then everything goes back to being the same again. And it's waiting for the, the, the next change before it, it triggers the uh, reactivity called the, the reset or the uh, kernel processing some request, the, the server processing some request. 
Okay. Um, the output completes and everything turns back to green. Uh, the next output, if we modify it, then it's gonna it's going to uh, say I need to recompute this. It's different now, so I need to go change. And I know that I'm being very informal with my my uh, conversation of uh, presentation of how I'm I'm expressing these different changes. But at the end of the day, well, let me do this. I'm going to pause on this tab for just a moment. What I wanted to do is just briefly express what an AND gate implies. So if we're, we've never dealt with AND gates before, this is not related to Shiny necessarily, but it is important for uh, networking, server logic, any form of mathematics, uh, electronics, et cetera. It all comes down to this AND gate concept. So an AND gate says, if I have two inputs, then I'll give an output. Well, if my input changes, then I need to reset before I can give an output. So the, the truth table concept isn't directly related to this reactivity function that I'm, I'm expressing here, but they do imply similar, uh, similar characteristics. If my cache memory changes or my request from the UI changes, I need to reset that value so that I can go calculate it again and then populate it and present it back to the UI. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions so far or does that that reference may be so far foreign, uh, and I apologize. Maybe it's my memory that that is uh, uh, thinking about the whole concept of an AND gate and how it relates to networking in general. Uh, maybe when we were children, or or maybe in your earlier uh, life, uh, you may have played the telephone game, and so the telephone game is is setting up you know a, a line of individuals, and then you know somebody starts a topic passes it to the next person, passes it to the next person, and et cetera, et cetera. By the end of the chain, normally you probably will not get the right answer back. Well, so that concept of reactivity or the concept of exchange between server and UI is similar. As I'm expressing that throughout this, this chain of functions, this shiny app that we're creating, uh, the, the, the function calls, as I'm modifying it, I have to interlink these named variables and update them within this cache memory, this R6 class that I'm referring to. All right, let's keep going. Uh, there's a topic in here about lazy loading, and that's actually what I'm trying to get to. Uh, so here we're talking about the input changes. Uh, this is from the UI to the server. Uh, our cache request changes. The memory allocation from the UI updates the cache. The uh, server realizes that that has been updated, so therefore it resets. From that reset function, it recalculates and then repopulates. Okay, so invalidating the inputs is that uh, concept of this resetting sort of scenario. Uh, notification of dependencies, uh, removing relationships. Um, I'm not giving this enough context. There's topics in here about erasing. Uh, when I use the term resetting, that's actually my implication of this erasing function. Uh, it's kind of like nullifying a variable and then recalculating and populating it again. This, this, this idea of resetting says I'm clearing that memory so that I have the uh, ability to uh, put a value back into it. Okay. Uh, Re-execution. Okay, I didn't do the exercises, but let me get past this dyna uh, dyna dynamism. Uh, it's dynamic. Uh, it's it's a it's a a uh, change of dynamic nature. It's not just about HTML5. It's not about just JavaScript. This dynamic workflow that we're creating with Shiny is reactivity is nothing more than this relationship of uh, a parent child uh, or, or uh, uh, inheritance, R6 inheritance, so that if, if the links between two points get modified, I call on the function to recalculate it and then repopulate it again. Okay, uh, let's keep going down. React log package. Okay, so now I'm going to start moving over to show you the screen, and we'll 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 be able to do this in a more uh, fluid manner. Uh, to be able to utilize the reactive graph as a option of debugging or witnessing shiny code uh, in 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 operation, we have to explicitly turn on this feature. 
And to achieve that, you're going to install the React log uh, as a package. Shiny already has it, but we need to enable it. We need to actually turn it on by it's, 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 the feature is off by default. So we have to explicitly tell uh, RStudio, uh, the IDE itself, when I start this service, please enter into debug mode and start recording the uh, session calls back and forth between my, my uh, UI and server. Start to record these exchanges, and then we're going to graphically represent what's going on here. To execute or to view the React log, uh, the, the React graph, uh, it's either Command F3 on Windows or Control F, excuse me, Command F3 on Mac or Control F3 on Windows. Um, after the app is closed, uh, run Shiny React Log Show to see the log for a complete session. Let's go in and, and start looking at this. Um, visually, I'm just going to switch over to the screen. This will be a little bit easier to represent. Uh, where is lazy loading at? Sorry, team. I wanted to, I'm missing on a topic here. When I was scrolling by, I think I went right over the top of it. Well, I'll pause and, and move on. The term lazy isn't a, in my own personal opinion, the word lazy doesn't apply exactly what's going on. What I use the term would be efficiency. I don't use lazy, I use the word efficiency instead. If we set up this kind of like geographic separation, right? I can be anywhere in the world and I'm interacting with the server that's anywhere in the world. And I have to go over the world's internet uh, to, to send these packets back and forth, okay? The idea is that that network costs a lot of money. Well, it's it's not a money monetary feature. It's it's time. It, it costs a lot of time to process uh, uh, the the exchange between my UI and and server. Now these are microseconds, but those microseconds add up to long wait times. Um, we've all probably been in a situation where we've went to uh, a particular website. Uh, interacting with the server and then just sat there and wait for the you know little spinny wheel or the progress bar to paint the UI. Right. Well, <clears throat> cache memory comes in as a technology in web development to assist in that speed and efficiency. So when I initially set up a call between a browser and, and server, I'm downloading a whole quantity of media uh, uh, to my machine. So the next time I go to that website, I may already have a lot of the libraries required to interact with that. Uh, if that's APIs, JavaScript libraries, uh, images, et cetera. I already have that on my, on my computer. And so now when I go to the site again, I already have everything that I need. I don't need to, to, to request that again. I only need some updated information. And I guess that's really at the core of what a reactivity Set, uh, reactivity call is in the context of Shiny. Okay, let's go to the React log because we're not. Uh, so the first thing, I have our our uh, initial example uh, up and running, uh, and this is common. Dump it into a Shiny app and then just run app. I've bumped this out from our studio uh, into our our uh, browser uh, so we can kind of see it in a larger larger setting. But again, we, if you recall, we had those, those uh, named variables, right? Uh, A, B, and C. And the initiated starting points of those three variables were 10, 1, and 1. We also had three other elements, X, Y, and Z. So X would be the graph. Uh, y is our uh, uh, table. And then Z would be this numeric value at the very bottom. And I apologize. I know it's all the way at the very uh, bottom right side of my or bottom left side of my screen. So now if I update this, well, before I go there, to do the reactive log, you do control F3 or command F3. And what that will do is open up a new window. Okay. Now, prior to the presentation, I ended up automatically going back to the beginning. But if I if I went to the end, I haven't interacted with this application yet. If I go to the very end of the stack, all right, this recorded sequential stepped sequence, I'm at 37 steps and all I did was open the app. Right, that's the, where the number 37 came in. 
this is this is all very busy. There's a lot of activity going on here. So I don't want to I don't want to get here yet. Let's go backwards to the beginning again and let's walk through this. So I have my input element. If you remember, the input is the uh, server's side, and then the output would be the UI, the uh, the rendered element, the the calculation, what I'm sending back to the UI. So as I step through this sequence, again, just starting the app, you can use these forward and back buttons to step through the sequence of logic of resetting, erasing, uh, calculating, and then populating variables. Down at the very bottom left corner, let me zoom in just a bit here for you, make that a little easier to see. Uh, we have uh, four color codes, ready is green, calculating is yellow, invalidating or erasing is going to be uh, uh, dark gray, and then invalidated, meaning it's already been really, uh, sorry, the memory has already been reset, is going to be a light gray color. And so looking at our, our graph here, we have a bunch of white text, white blocks that haven't been populated yet. Uh, we've got some light gray, meaning that we've instantiated or allocated memory, but there's nothing there. Think of it as like NA or null. There's nothing populated for it yet. Then we have this dark gray area of output X. I step to the next sequence. And I step to the next sequence. What I'm wanting you to see is as these values change. Okay, so here I'm calculating X. I'm now plotting to X. Uh, X, uh, sorry, plot object is, is rendering. Um, it requests from the client data output X width. It also requires a output X height. So this is like the dimensional values, X, Y values of setting up that graph. Okay. As this is passing information back and forth between these different functions, these named objects, it is rendering uh, the, the object, but it happens so quickly, we don't really see it. It's just, we start the app and magically we have a graph up and running, but there's a huge quantity of sequential steps that must be uh, followed to achieve that particular graph output. Now there's a reference in the chapter where it talks about the Shiny app being extremely complex, or as you, as you build a more complex Shiny app, the traceability becomes very difficult to witness how all of these different functional elements and, and object IDs work. The reactive graph allows you a opportunity to witness the relationship of who's talking to who, who's resetting each other. You can kind of almost walk through the function calls or, or the, the resetting, renaming, excuse me, stored values of media as these get populated. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second. Does anybody have any questions yet? Am I, am I, am I hitting everything that, that is your curiosity? Is there anything that's triggering like, or want to know a little bit more about what's happening here? Yeah. Okay, so basically, this is what happened behind my hub. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it starts from from the input of the first element, and that's okay. And then it goes through. Uh, somehow this starts before then B and then then C, and that, that's okay. So yeah. now, so we have basically uh, the three elements. Uh, we are going to plot to make the plot. That's correct. <laughs> This plot here uh, has elements on the left side, elements on the right side. Yes. Okay. So my mind is like with. <laughs> well. So it's it's going somewhere to do something while it's going back to to grab information and then I don't know. You're thinking correctly. No, you're you're thinking in exactly the right context. What 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 we're witnessing with this particular reactive graph and what is is difficult to bridge into is the package itself, right? These functions that are built into the package, the the idea that we have this shiny app package, right? Just by installing it and then writing some script elements between the UI and the and the server, and then 
executing or or uh, starting the server, starting the relationship between the browser and the and the UI, the excuse me, the UI and the server. When we establish that, it is executing all of these various functions. We're passing variables back and forth. Um, Frederica and I have been on on other uh, book club relations where uh, we uh, we pass into functions themselves. We actually enter into the logic of a given package and its its particular function, and then trace exactly what's going on from a from a textual standpoint. Here, what we're witnessing is the execution of those functions, and then the 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 the, the relationship, the lineage, the the uh, the exchange of that data between uh, these particular memory points. Does that help, Frederica? Uh, Brendan, you had your your uh, mic off as well. No, you can go ahead, Frederica. I know you're about to say something. I can go after. Uh, no, that that that's uh, give. I've, I've, I've given me an, an idea uh, a bit okay. more like, yeah, but then the, the, the chapter at some point mentioned the fact that you can, with this graph, have a look at the what's happened behind your app. So if it's not, if you are not satisfied because it's, it's too complicated, right. this is a nice representation to identify where and how you how, I don't know. So where you can, you need to modify your app to make right. it, uh, okay. So this is a, a, a point that should be like, I, I like to understand a bit more because I, I don't, I, I can't understand how, how can I, uh, so even if I figure out a different combination, how do I change it? So. You wouldn't. Well, that's a great comment. It, it's not that you're changing it here in this this point. This is like the recording, right? Uh, you you have um, here. Let me let's try going over here just briefly. Stick with me for a brief moment. Uh, I think it's F12. Yes. Uh, if you were to go into developer mode of your browser, and you can do this on Firefox, Edge, uh, Safari, Chrome, um, any browser usually has some form of a development mode. Within the development mode, there is a recording feature, and I think it's what I have pulled up right now. Um, we were talking about the WebSocket in, in another book club. Uh, Lucio, uh, Lucio knows what I'm referring to in that regard. But the what you can do is uh, how do I JavaScript? There's a way here where just try and reset this for a brief moment. So what we're what we're seeing in this recording, and this is this is a bad example. Where's my where is my there's a recorder feature, but that's not what I want to pull up here. It's not lighthouse, that's a measurement of performance. Well, at any rate. As I interact with the browser, and, I, and in this case, it's the shiny server that I'm getting some, some exchange back and forth with, we start to record the passing of information. And, and really, I guess the, the element here is that you're changing the visibility of what you're, what you're viewing. But really, it's the same, right? Because the, the, the calls back and forth between your various libraries, it's going to be the same. The focus of what I'm paying attention to and recording or what I'm rendering on the screen uh, is going to be different. So if I go to my WebSocket for uh, JavaScript, images, media, um, I don't know what manifest is necessarily, but the, the, uh, these different uh, graphs, um, you can go back and debug your code. So Frederica, to your, your benefit, what you had just mentioned, in the React log itself, you're not going to be manipulating anything. This is like the recorded output of, of uh, your app. But if you notice that you've you've uh, you're processing something a certain way, but it's not it's not operating as intended, you could look at the log to debug and figure out where the missing link is to to uh, correct in your script. Does that help? This is the recording itself. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. 
Olu, I'm sorry. Did you want to make a comment as well? Yes. Okay. Okay. But thank you very much uh, for a good presentation. But I know this React log uh, is like the back end of Shining, how Shiny do work. And I really want you to really explain further because I know we have in Shiny, we have inputs and we have reactivity. Then at the end, uh, we have the output. So, and because if you look at the book in which you showed earlier mm -hmm. on, they show those parts and also the dependencies. So with the graph, I really want you to really highlight what is depending on what. Yes. Uh, let's go. There was that part about dynamism where the, the graph is showing the, the various named objects and how they relate. Is this your, your reference, Olu? Um, yes, yes. So uh, let, me, let, me, let me try it this way. I'm going to move this to the side here, and we're going to have to zoom out to allow to view it and try to move that about right there. And then I'm going to put the React log on the other side. Now, by me resetting that, that, that refresh on the screen, I, I recorded some more information. Uh, so it's going to, I guess now it's still at 37. OK, um, let's move this here. I'll try to zoom in a bit. Sorry, I want to I want to give the full attention to what this is, but also have enough space that in the recording in the future, anybody can see what I'm referring to. So let's zoom in here just a bit and let's zoom in over here just a bit. OK, now what I'm going to do next, I, I, I'm at step 37. So again, this is just starting the server. We didn't walk through all 37 steps, but that's OK. What I'm going to do now is interact with our UI, reset those values, request calculation from the server, and then plot or, or render those outputs back to the UI. OK, so it's a, it's a, it's a round robin circle of I'm going to exercise from the UI, trigger the reactive call to the server, the server will, will process some information and then record it back to the browser. So let's change this A to, I don't know, let's go 20 to zero. Okay. Now, all I did, if you didn't probably witness it, but a moment ago, you noticed that your, your scale changed. Let me go back to 10, see if I can do that again. All right, so it starts here at 2.0 and it ends at 4.0. Let's just use that as the scale, all right? If I go to 20 to zero, okay, now it starts at 20 and goes up to 30. All right, now, if you remember, that was a multiplier of two. It took A times B, I think, or, or there was a the function call. I don't have the, the uh, script running next to it to view it. Um, but with this text entry modification, I'm modifying the, 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 uh, the scale on the X coordinates of our graph. Going over here to our reactive call, I can now step through this. Uh, let's try and refresh that real quick. There we go. Um, forgive me, I had to refresh the browser. It now increased. Uh, yeah, so we're at 63 at the moment. So let's go backwards here. We're at like 37. So by changing the value input of A, um, I'm going to give this focus again because the objects are too small to view when it's rendered that small. Uh, as I reset the values, you can see the relationship of the plot object. So we're resetting, we're resetting the, the variables. We are recalculating here in a moment. You're going to see the, the yellow prompt come up, okay? Because now I'm passing new information to that, uh, L, uh, that, that variable, the memory allocation. I'm resetting that value. Uh, I need to also trigger from cache memory to the server. I need that value recalculated and then send it back. Um, okay, so now it resets, it resets, it resets. Okay, now there really isn't much, I guess, 
meaning behind this because I'm not logically passing these back and forth based on our, our uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, example, the, the example script. Um, I'm not walking through each one of the steps themselves, but by me changing, is that again, sorry. Pull that back down. Sorry, uh, my computer can be a little bit funny sometimes. Let's try that. That was only one particular variable that I'm interacting. If I change my my uh, the the object B, okay, this is your your bin width, all right, or how many bins that you're going to be populating. Okay. Just by me putting those inputs there it will automatically trigger the reactive call to, to modify so that the object X, the plot, can also render as well. If I go to the bottom, you're gonna see these data elements, or textual elements at the bottom, the Y and Z uh, that we have allocated, the table itself and the, and the, uh, the textual output. Um, those are also being calculated and changed as well. So let's go here back to our reactive graph and I'm gonna, I'm gonna recycle that and give that back to focus again. And let's fast forward. Okay, so as you go through these steps, above in the, in the UI itself, the, the, the React Graph UI itself, you're seeing this relationship between uh, the, the function calls. Also, the time associated to rendering and also um, your session ID is kind of like the um, environment, this, this uh, when you started the server, that allocation of memory, this temp space, this R6 class space, that session is all local to itself. So that's the numeric hex value that gets placed there. Stepping through each one of these points, resetting, I'm recalculating some value because I need to update the plot. And now you can see some activity going down here with this input B changing as well. All right. Um, I don't think I'm doing it much justice here uh, because I'm not actually walking through how the value gets reset. And it's just a very large number of steps uh, that occur. But the, the idea of this chapter is introducing you to this particular debugging utility React Graph that allows you to witness the relationships between the UI and the server. It is recorded. So to Frederica, your earlier comment of, of manipulation, you're not changing anything here. This is a this is a, a, a output of what the script is doing. So if you see any error, wait a second, I'm not resetting that. That's supposed to be passing over, et cetera, et cetera. Now I can go in and manipulate the script to debug or, or change whatever calls back and forth I'm dealing with. Okay. What are your, what's the team's thoughts uh, with my uh, rhetoric here? Your opinions anyway. I like it. Um, I like that there's, um, well, whenever there's sort of a visual component to a company, whatever you're doing, it's much more helpful. And I could see why it would help in, debugging at least if it's not too complicated if you were to draw out your own expectations of how you think it expect of how you think it um it would work and see if it would map on um the thing that i'm having trouble trying to visualize is um what it would look like say in a for loop or in a loop sort of like let's say you change an input and it triggers some sort of operation occur hundreds of times um yeah i guess would it depend on the type of loop you're creating or not um, necessarily, well, that's a great comment. No, no, that's outstanding. Uh, no, it wouldn't necessarily uh, change the graph. What you would witness in a loop scenario, let's, I don't know, do some uh, per map mapping kind of uh, uh, replacement concepts. As that looping feature uh, uh, renders over and over and over again, what you would witness is a huge quantity of steps when you execute that loop. 
right? So all of a sudden you'd go from, I don't know, you're at, at step 10 and then all, you know, end at a hundred. And between that point in time, the step 10 versus step 100, you're just going to see this loop continually resetting, 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 resetting. Does that help Brendan? Be yeah, the, I think it does. Because um, now you're visually seeing as the loop executes, it'll just keep running over and over again on itself. Yes. Right. Okay, cool. Um, I guess, cause I know a lot of people use shiny apps to say run simulations for people. Yeah. And so if you're doing the Monte Carlo simulation with 10 and then, you know, you have 10,000 samples, um, <laughs> you'd be in the millions of, of steps by that point. Right. Okay. So I guess that's kind yeah. of where, um, the reactive graph sort of, um, I guess it isn't as helpful. Um, well, yeah, because the, the the sheer volume of of information that is required to to render those those uh, simulation modes, um, it, it, it's it's CPU taxing, right? It takes a long time to process, and then the other uh, is is a lot of memory space. We've always talked about you know memory allocation, and sometimes if you don't want to go Stack Overflow and just completely burn up your RAM, but um, the the execution of that simulation and the uh, memory allocation has a direct reflection. Um, do I have enough resources at my disposal to execute that simulation mode? Um, Frederica, if you don't mind me pulling you into the conversation, I know we've we've ran into this error before on your particular laptop. It, did, there's not enough space. There's not enough memory to to run some of the the code. Yeah. Yeah. But, but to Brendan's uh, relationship, uh, so to, to Brendan's question, the stepped sequence is where that just, it, it, will, it will go off into infinity, but it's all recorded. And that's the real key to this. It is going to be recorded and you could go back and, and visually witness the variables getting reset, changed, modified, updated, et cetera. But basically, what I, what I so the, the steps grow uh, grow um, grow uh, along with your uh, inputs growing, or they are a certain number of steps and they stay like that because there are a few things that are still not very clear. Well, that's a good question. So yeah, in 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 relation to this example, my my code here. Let's go back to R real quick, team. Uh, I don't have that on this right screen. Let's pull that over so we can see it. So uh, zoom in, that's too small for anybody to witness. There we go, uh, too, that's too, too large. Um, the relationship of these few lines of code establishes a, a lot of logic, a lot of, of uh, relationship. We have, at least at minimum right now at the moment, six variables that we've created. Uh, can I, I don't see I'm in the, in the environmental variable, but um, numeric input A, numeric input B, numeric input C. We know we've got at least three named variables that, that are going to store a value. We have the plot output X, the table output Y, and the table output Z. So again, that now adds three more. So that's where the number six comes in. Well, inside of this is also the function calls. So going back to the React log, in the middle of all of this, we see client data pixel ratio, client data output X width. Um, the, uh, I guess that's the only ones that I'm looking for. And even, even you can even drag uh, a bit and move it. You can, yeah. If, if yeah. you need to spread these out a little bit more to, to visually, you're not changing the relationship. It's just going to dynamically modify the linkage, right? Um, what is that term called? It's like D3JS, the, the, uh, the dynamic space of being able to move everything, but they're still, it's like polygons, they're still uh, glued together. Um, you're still linking yeah, the those. Structure, the structure stays, basically. Correct, correct. Yeah, but yeah you can move these around. I. I haven't found a way so what's to. What's the purpose of moving the, those around? Uh, okay, you, you can see them like better, but can you do something with that moving? No. Uh, no, because this is only uh, uh, representing the step, right? This is, this is painting uh, at this point in time during processing. This is what we're doing. Um, have you, let me ask this question to the team. Has anybody ever went through the stepped function? I don't think this is a good example because I don't know if I have that ability. 
um, in our, yeah, when you when you execute the, the debugging feature of, of a script, um, over on the side, there's another window that pops open. And as you walk through, it'll reset. You'll see it change on the, the debug side. Then you, you can step into the next function, the next uh, sequence of events. I'm, I'm, I'm walking through this as the script is running. Right? That's exactly what the React graph is doing, but now it's in a visual form. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. That helps. Yeah, yeah. No, no. It's that that's visually very useful. So it makes up in your mind what's happening behind your app. Agreed. That, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lucio, you had a question. Uh, yeah, I have a doubt. Uh, could you show the uh, the the React graph first? I sure can. There we in, are, sir. In that area, for example, where it says play and data output x height. Uh, my doubt is oh, this area yeah. here, sir. Yeah, so my my question is uh, such polygon is represented uh, with the same as uh, as we've been doing with the inputs because would it be the case that if we were to change, for example, such height, maybe through maybe directly through JavaScript, uh, would that also force an update for the code in the plot object? I think it's a reactive component. Uh, well, I'll answer it this way. The client data, this, this named object client data, and then output X width, this is your, uh, uh, that uh, it would be a, it would be a relationship to the plot object package, right? Or the, the, the plot object function. Um, Frederica, if you don't mind me, exercising your your knowledge for a brief moment or if any of the other team is familiar with what i'm doing um there's a way let's stop the app real quick there's a way that i can call on the inner points this is an advanced r topic but it's a plot object excuse me plot object and plot output sorry Plot output, but there's a there's a way that I can I can get more information inside this one function uh, that like the class. Do you remember that, Frederica? What was the was type of? So how I, I don't think this is going to work. No, that doesn't. But there, there's uh, without the parentheses. Or... Well, there's. That plot output with a, a little. So if you go inside the the grub, you need to, it's plot uh, with a, a capital O. When you, you... Plot object. Yeah. Or okay. plot output. Okay. Yeah. But this, that this one, is... yeah, I haven't passed anything. So me calling on that doesn't do anything. What I was doing, what I was trying to, to show Luis, uh, Lucio, you can enter into the function itself. And I'm sorry, my brain is not connecting to the advanced R book of what those three <laughs> points are. Uh, but there's a way that you can access internal to the plot output script, the, the actual function script. And I, I can guarantee you, Lucio, there's probably going to be a client, whatever that name was, uh, variable inside that would not be passed out to the screen, like a standout to the screen, but internal to memory, the function is 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 processing internal. Yeah, let's try that real quick. Uh, let's see, uh, sorry, our studio. You mean inside the function um, uh, chapter? Um... Yes, yes. I, I'm 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 racking my brain because I'm, I'm I know. Yeah, uh, we got three yeah, yeah, no, arguments or what? Yeah, arguments. Ah, uh, okay. You can do formals, body, environment. That's it. Yes, those. What? Uh, but what's the uh, what's the what's the format of that R syntax? R A R G S arguments, then plot output. Well, no? uh, say that one more time, Olu. Just type arguments. Yes. Okay, and, and then. Uh, 
enter then plot output within parentheses. No, within oh, okay. parentheses. Our plot output. Now, do we do we include the parentheses yeah. as, as no? A just run. No, don't just like that. Okay. Yes, close it. Yes, run. Huh? You need to start shiny. I think it's working over here. Let me. Oh, check. that's a good point. Let's try that real quick. Uh, but if uh, if I Library run the app, shiny. if I run the app, do I lose my current console? I think it's working here for me. Library shiny. Library shiny then plots outputs. It will work. And then what was the second line, Olu? Yes, plot outputs. Arguments, plot outputs. Argument. Uh, is it is it yes, yes. ARG or, or ARGS? ARGS. Okay, very good. Plot outputs. Come on. There we go. Yes. Um, Wrong. Okay. okay. I think it shows. The, so this this is indicating the output ID, the width at one hundred percent, height at one hundred percent. Um, I I I believe what Lucio was mentioning up here is that would be the function of what plot output is doing. So we have an uh, output ID, and then the same this this arguments that Olu's referencing the 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 call that we have for this args is that same line of text. Um, formals, let's try formals. I know we're off on a tangent, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> let's see, plot, I can type. No, I don't have it in there either. And then there is type of as well that you did it. You said that type of. This one here with the function inside without the parentheses type yeah. of uh, it's it's a type of closure okay that that doesn't mean the formals then then you can do the function and um, in itself without the parentheses and see if you can access to the function because you've not said that you can access to the function well what what I was after or what I was trying to to forgive me that's me watching the videos um. What I was trying to show was how can I how can I access a named variable client data that isn't so it's 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 allocated in memory it it, it has a it has a variable name that we can we can utilize but how do I actually view where it's at and I'm referring to a couple of videos that June uh, provided to us where he was going into the 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 actual operation of logic and and being able to view some of the the uh the uh calls back and forth uh not 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 in a rendered form but just being able to to view them and i'm i'm, I'm losing my brain here it, it makes me look uh not that i'm i'm familiar with it i'm not as familiar with it i'm slightly uncomfortable at the moment with uh trying to express what i'm referring to um to Lucio's benefit, what I was attempting to, to say is that these three objects are not in our script necessarily, but they are represented in the plot object because I need to, I need to render these uh, based on the uh, information that the UI text input is providing us and then what those variables are you those values are used to calculate from the server's end to send back. It seems that we can read such data, uh, such claim data dollar output using the session object that we saw this week. Uh, that was, let's go back to R real quick. Uh, it was, what was the, what was the syntax, if you don't mind, Lucio? Session client data, good point. But is do, uh, do I do I need that while the okay? Let's try that. 
That has to be while it's running, though, correct? Yes. Yeah, so would, uh, we would have to start the app, but then my, my curiosity, and I'm sorry that this is where I, I start to break down. If, if we're running the app, we lose the interactive mode of the console because the app is, is active, the server's active, our studio's active. Um, even if I were to pass that session data, I'm not gonna get anything back. Um, does, does anybody know how I can, I can access that? point here uh, perhaps we could like in the ui add a verbatim text output so that okay. we can send such variable session client data and, and maybe try to see if it actually brings the value i don't think the session i don't think the ui is familiar with the session i think that's the server side correct Yes. I don't think it would be in the UI. It would be on the server's end, correct? Because only the server knows about the session. Yeah, I meant like only to add a, a section where we can see the value. So like a verbatim text output or, or perhaps just any regular text output. And that's sorry, Lucio. I'm only using you as an example. Um, then, so this is session client data. Is my text even making sense there? Frederica mentions shiny plot output as an option. Um, I, I, I guess I, we, we went off on a 10 minute tangent. I was attempting or hoping to indicate based on Lucio's question, how to, how to view the client data at that moment in time. And then uh, as we step through each of the points, see that value change. Um, and I, I, I think you, we're all agreeing that, excuse me, we're all agreeing that we would have to add another uh, link, uh, a, a, another point where it would, it would give us that value as it, as it populates. And I know I'm, I'm coding on the fly and that's never a good thing for a presentation, I apologize. Uh, basically, you do you do nothing. You just to do your app, and then when you call the reactive log, it's populated by itself because of the app. So that, that's correct. Yes, that would be correct. Um, I, I don't know from Lucio's comment though. I don't know how to um, view that uh, uh, data. So we 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 know that the value currently is listed at nine thirty, right? Uh, and I bet if I moved my screen or or, or uh, uh, repopulated that that um, coordinates of pixel size, right? How much how much space I'm taking up on my screen would probably change as well. But, um, have I have I for the purposes of this chapter and the closure uh, for the uh, the session? What I want to convey to the team is really being able to execute, keep going back to the wrong point here, team, sorry. I don't know which browser I had open that, that yeah, let's just move that out of the way. It's this, um, close that for a second. The commands to execute. So the, the, the biggest point to all of this would be, um, being able to, to turn on or enable. By default, this feature of Shiny is, is, is set to false. We don't, we don't have it as an option. Um, so if you were to 
render your, your browser and then do uh, command F3 or control F3, the window will pop back and say, uh, uh, the React graph is not uh, available to you. Uh, please execute this line of text prior to starting the app. Um, there's another uh, there's another feature earlier in the text where you had a side by side comparison of the of the actual script itself, uh, and then the other half is your is your uh, shiny app, and you can see the it'll flash at you as the as the function call uh, is being executed. And I, I don't remember what that argument is, and I apologize uh, to to render that, but you just shiny react log show. And then now you can you can have this recording feature of of elements. I hope I at least if 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 anything triggered your curiosity to execute or utilize this feature. I believe all of us probably in this book club have shiny apps that we're we're actively developing or um, can render ourselves. So by turning up this feature gives you an opportunity to start to witness the intricacies, uh, similar to Brendan's comment about the for loop or uh, Lucio's comment about the, the client data, et cetera, executing that. Does anybody have any final questions? I know we're, we're way over on time, about 20 minutes over, well, 10 minutes over on time. I don't have any questions, but just wanted to say thanks for bailing yeah. me out. And also this is a great presentation. <laughs> you bet, not a problem, Brendan. Um, I know the upcoming chapter uh, is going to be uh, reactive building blocks and then escaping the graph. All of these build upon what I'm attempting to do here. I may be reaching out into these other chapters and, and, and pulling information in, I apologize. Uh, but these next coming chapters are all related to reactivity and this React graph. So we'll get to see this again. Okay, great. Awesome. All right. Thank you. You bet. Yep, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll find out who our next, I'll find out who our next uh, presenter is. I don't know if we have anybody listed at the moment, but uh, we'll figure it out. So. All right. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great weekend. You too. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.